The views expressed on the Convo Lounge do not reflect the views of our current employers or our future employers. Welcome to the Convo Lounge, everybody. I am your co-host, Char Rochelle, joined with my co-host, Amir Anthony, Antonio Crow, and we are joined by a very special guest, Victor Gabriel, licensed hey. to family therapist, hey. a black male therapist. Come on. Boom, boom. Out here, feel me? Out here. Real <laughs> quick, I'm not licensed, though. I'm not licensed, though. Associate Marriage Family Therapist, so I'm not licensed. I'm okay, not licensed okay, anymore. my bad. Yeah. Is life the goal? Yeah, it's not. Now it is. Now it is. It wasn't okay. for because I've been I've been a therapist for a while. I wasn't for a little bit because I was doing film stuff too. So I was kind of like, I I need to get licensed. I'll just be a therapist and go do film. But now I might like coming back to him, be like, I might as well do it. You know what I'm saying? So I just spoke it into existence. Then oh, it's oh. coming. <laughs> let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. So all right, Antonio, what you got for us? Okay, so question of the day. It was initially posed to men only, but we're going to combo lounge it, all right? So the I'm one of the of, boys. Yeah, that's right. So if your homie likes a woman, but she don't want uh -oh. him, she wants you. Is she off limits? If the homie wants a woman. Okay, real quick. Look. Okay, so one more time. If your homie likes a woman, but she don't like him. She likes you. Is she off limits? <laughs> oh, you trying to get people in trouble, bro. You trying to get people in trouble. You trying to get... I feel like it's contextual, right? Absolutely. Yeah, like I feel like it just depends. I feel like if the homie, if the homie's like, if if you my homie, and you really, really, really like her, bro, like. You talking about a hey, hey Vic, boom, 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 boom. And she's feeling me. I sort of feel like just off the strength, I'ma just slide like I'm like, I'm not trying to hurt my homies feeling. You feel me? Like it's just that's just messed up. It's not for me, that's not my energy. You know what I'm saying? My energy's not that. I think it's within your rights though, to keep it G. I think it's within your rights, but for me personally, I just sort of feel like that's just not my energy. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. I feel like if she chews up, she chews up. You already know the deal is how I feel. If she chews up, she chews up. It is what it is, bro. Like, I just feel like she chews up, she chews up. <laughs> but if there's, like, some sort of, like, if there's some sort of, like, conversation we've had, like, if I talk to Amir, you feel me, and we're like, blah, 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 and he knows about it, he knows, and but she feels Amir, not me, my expectation is Amir. Like, if we had a conversation about it prior, it'd be kind of wild for me to come back, like, three weeks later, you with, you with her. I'm going to be hot. Okay, so right. you know what I what, what made me think about your question, uh, Antonio, was uh, in Boomerang when Marcus and David Allen Greer's character was going at it with Halle Berry's character, and okay. they they was going at it. So I don't know. It, it's 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 crazy because like, you know, nah, I couldn't do it. it you know, and I would. It's too many women out there to break up a friendship with one of your boys. You feel me? And like it's, a, and like it's a co-worker or somebody that's like your golf buddy or your buddy you hoop with. This is like your boy. Like y'all got stories. You feel me? That's yeah. your brother. So in that situation, I was like, hey, bro, I'll be honest with them. Like, hey, man, she hit me up. She reached out to me on IG. She, she listened to the podcast and, you know, something, something, you know. But she giving me some energy and it's kind of uncomfortable. But, you know, just wanted to let you know. And then that could kind of diffuse the situation. And then we both ain't got to worry about it. She out. She out the circle. She don't disrupt the circle. Right, 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 right. What if she's super bad, though? It's, it's a lot of super bad sisters out there, bro. I'm not tripping. It sounds optimistic. <laughs> I feel you, Amir, and that's my energy too. But it sounds good. I just, I, I'm not sure that's what happens though. It sounds good. I feel you, I'm, Amir. I'm with you, bro. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be professional, and I'm trying to be. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to be mindful of my audience. <laughs> <laughs> 
Smart, smart man. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and take a sip of my uh, lemon water. <laughs> All right, Antonio. I'm, I'm feel, nervous, but I'm I'm ready. Right. I feel uh, relationships last longer than friendships, or friendships. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. I said uh -huh. that wrong. Friendships last longer than relationships. So mm -hmm. I'm always trying to maintain solid friendships over temporary relationships. So I don't know. I would not I would not engage with old girl if I knew that she initially was feeling my homie. So uh and if my homie like 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 Vic said, if my homie was on her like, oh man, like oh she sent me these pictures, oh we went out, oh we did this, oh we did that, then I'd be like. She low key trying to hit me up. I'll probably be like, "No, nah, I'm good. I'm good." Yeah, I'm good. That's so, it. did did anybody actually in this scenario has anybody actually dated? Has anybody had sex? Has anybody like has there been any fluid swap? Because I feel like if it's all if if it's all neutral, then it's fair game. Well, I, I don't know. I'm just saying. I, I do have an experience though where I was chasing a lady and she didn't want me and her friend wanted me and then she got mad after I, you know, engaged with her friend. But I had nothing with the person that initially didn't want me. But she yeah. didn't because I engaged with her friend. But that's absolutely like if, if no one's actually talked to one another, like if there if no if if it's a if it's a scenario where she didn't date the homie, then I don't see, the, what's the big deal? Yeah, it's just about like, uh, according to- Yeah, the, according that's to fair the, game. How do you know, how do you know that that wasn't divine intervention for oh, you to oh, lose that young lady? Possible. People like who they like. Okay. I feel you. I think I'm more about what practically happens. You feel me? Like, because everything sounds good. I just know men's feelings, our feelings get turned up when it comes to when we interact with each other and women. I just think our feelings get turned up. You know what I'm saying? I almost squabbled with somebody because I got my feelings hurt. I was, I was, I was the guy that didn't get trolled. You feel me? I almost squabbled with the homie. <laughs> you feel me? And that was my bad. That was my bad. That was his bad. I mean, that wasn't his bad, you feel me? But I know that I almost squabbled him over, like, getting my feelings hurt. I've been in both situations. I've been the guy that the girl wanted to talk to and also been the guy that the girl didn't want to talk to. So, um, I feel like it's yeah. an ecosystem of life. So you just go with the flow. <laughs> That's how I feel. I feel you. Okay. It's all good. Yeah, I mean... That's a good way to open up the show. <laughs> Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Yeah. yeah. So, so for all of our loungers out here, we got a special show for y'all. We got Brother Vic on here today, who has a wonderful platform, you know, had a chance to peep it out and, you know, focusing on Black men and trauma. Um, mm -hmm. so his film, Black Boys Don't Cry, or Black Boys Can't Cry, I'm sorry, Black Boys Can't Cry. Um, so Vic, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how this all came about with your short film? No problem, brother. I appreciate you. First of all, Amir, Shar, Antonio, I just appreciate y'all, like, even inviting me on the platform. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's super love. I'm humble. You feel me? It's, I just truly appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? My spirit's always with my people. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank um, you. I, well, I go to AFI Conservatory, which is a, um, a film school in LA. And I went there for screenwriting, right? I went there for screenwriting. And as a, I was doing screenwriting, but as I was there, I sort of wanted to start directing, but it's difficult to try to get into like doing directing things when your discipline is screenwriting. When you're one discipline, they don't let you like veer off into other disciplines. Mm -hmm. They just sort of don't do it like that. But I had a relationship with one of the cinematographers. He's native, an indigenous brother. His name's Robert. And he had a thesis thing he had to do, which is basically do like a short sort of film, like no dialogue. And me and him talked, and I had an idea. I wrote the script, and I, and I was like, yo, let me direct it. And he was like, please do it. 
And he could have went and asked a bunch of other directors to do it. So basically, it just came from me and him talking in our relationship. In terms of conceptually, um, my black, the Black Boys Can't Cry is basically centered around a father who's dealing with unresolved trauma and it's manifesting itself at night in night terrors and nightmares mm -hmm. with his um, wife and his daughter. And he's dealing with something that he has not dealt with that keeps flashing back, right? Mm -hmm. And um, he ends up attacking his family, trying to attack his family, but by the end of the movie, he gets calmed down by his mom, by his mom. Um, and I, it, the premise sort of came from my own night terrors and nightmares I would have as a, as a kid. And even, and this as a man, like I'll just wake up screaming. I didn't really know what to do. And mm -hmm. it also came from my black male and trauma group also being a therapist and hearing a lot of the PTSD stories from the men in my group and just trying and trying to figure out like, what's a great way to like portray this in um, like a film form, but something which deals with the silence of black males, which is black men don't talk about the things that happen to us, right? Like across the board, across the board. We just don't talk about nothing. We don't talk about it. And I don't think we're allowed to talk about it. We're not allowed, I don't think we're allowed to talk about it. I think we feel some type of way with our woman, with society. And that's why it's called black boys can't cry. Not that they shouldn't cry, not that they don't, but that they can't, that there's something stopping us from actually dealing with our emotions you know what i'm saying so that's mm -hmm. sort of like the premise of where it came from and um like how it came to be it was real cheap did it for like five racks you feel me and yeah it's been going through festivals and it's been having like a lot of like surprising success because really short it's like five minutes so i i thought it would do okay but i didn't think that some of the stuff that's been happening recently i didn't expect it to pick up like that and there could be some more stuff happening you know what i'm saying so I'm, I'm like, man, I'm even blessed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what's up. That's, That's what's up. Yeah. Appreciate you sharing that, bro. So yeah, man. what have some what has been some of the, the feedback, type of feedback that you've received directly from the people that have viewed it? Yeah. Um it's been beautiful, bro. It's been super beautiful. It's only been positive, really. Mm -hmm. It's only been positive. It's it's only been like this is a I've never seen something like this, typically, is what I hear. But the, the other feedback is actually that's it's not, not not that it's negative feedback, but it's that's difficult to watch. It's mm. difficult to watch and that it's difficult. And I think some I think to be fair, it's difficult for me to watch. It was difficult for me to write about. It was difficult for me to shoot. I'm just gonna be completely mm. honest. So it's actually feedback that I feel too <laughs> when I watch it. Like when I watch it, I'm uncomfortable. You feel mm. me? When I feel when I feel yeah, and I sometimes feel weird showing it to people or showing it to like the black community because it is it is like cutting through and dealing with essentially, I, I guess I'll just give it away. Essentially, it's a black man who was sexually assaulted when he was a kid, right? And now he's <laughs> grown up and he's having flashbacks to when he to what happened. And it's and it's he's having a hard time, like his night terrors and it's affecting his his marriage and his and his um relationship with his daughter not in any crazy way but just like he keeps waking up having nightmares and yelling right yeah. and and, and just by the end of the movie like it's his mom basically like calming him down and that's what happens like and his whole family sort of rallies around him and that's difficult for i think that's just difficult for people to talk about much less see you know what i'm saying it's it's easy to talk about a little bit with women when they have set, when they've been assaulted or been abused but it's much difficult to talk about with black men and i think that those are the sort of the secrets which I see as a therapist because I talk to the men. Um, I see the, the violent things that happen. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to figure out how to bring relief, you know what I'm saying, to suffering. Yeah. Um, I yeah. appreciate the narrative that you, that you brought to light because you are right. Even within my friend circle, many of my friends, many of my family members have been molested as kids and then, or, and or rape as teenagers or even adult women. And it's a conversation yeah. that we openly have, like no hard, yeah. hold barred conversations um, that we get to have with one another because we feel safe enough to have that conversation. But yeah. rarely ever do you hear a man say it either to his partner, his family member or whatever have you. So I appreciate you for even bringing that. It's a hard narrative, I get it. 
but I appreciate you for bringing it to to the yeah. forefront. Okay. Yeah, also, go ahead, Amir. No, I was just going to echo, you know, that, yeah, I mean, you know, it makes me think about the movie or the film that have, uh, came out a few years ago, uh, Moonlight, you know, um, yeah. and how powerful that was. And, you know, people, if you look beyond the surface of what the film portrayed, the stages of this young Black man, look at the impact of Black men in his life, the character that uh, Marsha, I don't know how you say his name, Marshava Ali, his character. I think I said mm -hmm. his name right, I apologize. Marshala Ali. Yes, his character was so influential in the film because it helped with his development as a black man. But right. thinking about the outline of your short film made me think about that movie because when I watched it, it was so powerful to see the stages of this young black man growing up in the ghetto um, and being able mm -hmm. to overcome the things that, the traumas that he went through. So that's what that's what resonated. But you know, to kind of echo everything, it, I think it's really important that as black men, you're and you can talk about it later. Your group that you have, um, we as yeah. black men have all had some kind of traumatic experience, whether it is something related to your story that you filmed, or if it's something that's happened. Um, you know, for me, I think about my time growing up and and being in the public school setting, right? and how I was treated versus some of my peers that weren't Black, and how that I had to overcome those experiences to be where I am sure. today, working in higher ed and how I want to pay it for it. So we've yeah. all experienced it, and I think it's important to continue to tell those stories, whether they're short films or theatrical films, Netflix, whatever it is. As long as our stories are being told, we have to do it because we have been and you know, hurt and, and involved too, and especially when it comes up to, to black men. Yeah. I wanted to add too, with my, I think the other part is difficult for at least um, like heterosexual black men to talk about mm -hmm. assault because we connected to, me being a heterosexual black male, we connected to, oh, it means I'm gay or it means blah, 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 where I was just saying that this happens and it's, completely unrelated to your sexual orientation. But for whatever reason, I know that that we talk, we don't talk about it because it makes us feel powerless and it makes us feel like, um, like, like, oh, maybe I'm this, maybe I'm that. And I'm like, well, it's complete, it's not related to that at all. This is just something that was taken from you. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? No doubt. And so, and I hate the fact that sometimes it's connect, like when, men are abused or sexually assaulted, it's automatically like, oh, they're this or they're, or they're, or they're gay. I'm like, no, those are two different things completely mm -hmm. like assault and your sexual orientation have nothing, nothing to do with each other. That's, so it was important for me for him to be like, he was, he had, a, he, he was with, he was with a woman and he had a child. Mm -hmm. Like he would, like, he's already like survived and processed through this. And it has nothing to do with, you know, um, I want to free men up to be able to talk about this thing without being scared about things, which, right. I feel like unrelated, if that makes any sense. No, 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 it doesn't. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of scenes, and especially yeah. with, with, I'll say, in the African-American community, uh, to be able to talk things out is like a taboo. Like, yeah, like straight up. Just, just being being a person that is transparent and willing to talk, people not are not so forthcoming with, with our experiences in the past. Mm -hmm. And so we harbor them. That's probably why uh, therapy is so important for for a lot yeah. of us, but um, but I I just like I just like the fact that 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 you were bold enough to even have this concept go forward, like yeah. And it takes a bold, not only a vulnerability, but a boldness. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. because people are afraid to talk about things that happened in the past, like and it, yeah. just me personally, I had experience where I was traumatized because my mom's husband was an alcoholic. Mm. Right. And so from zero mm. to five, you know, it was a lot of violence in my household. Right. Mm. So when I talk about it, it's almost like my experience was deflated because people want to know, well, did he hit you? Was he abusive to you? No, yeah. I was I was a, a a I visually saw my mom being hurt by somebody that I could had no help to help. You know, what I mean, I could yeah. not right. help my mom. You know what I'm saying? So I was helpless. And so that's very vulnerable. So anyway, 
moving forward, man, I, I give you a lot of props for this, man, because there's so many people like us who have experienced trauma because of trauma. People count black people out like psychologists count black people out because we experience trauma from zero to five mm. years old. They count us out. And the lot of us don't even know we was traumatized, bro. I didn't even know I was traumatized. That's a yeah. fact. That's a fact. That's yeah. a fact. That, that's so true. Um, I've, I've shared, you know, many a times that I've, I've been in therapy for the last three years. And um, just to be completely transparent, I had an appointment yesterday with my therapist and we were just catching up on something. And mind you, we've, I've been talking to the same therapist for three years. And she and I had uncovered something from my childhood that I hadn't even processed. And I'm like, I didn't even know that, you know, X affected me like this. And this is why I can't handle Z. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different layers to trauma and unpacking your trauma that sometimes yeah. we just subconsciously don't mm. even connect the dots to. Yeah. It's crazy. That's that's one hundred percent. That's one hundred percent correct. And to, I think Amir, I think all three of you said, all, all of us are saying it. Like, we all sort of go. Black people just go through trauma. Period. Macro picture. You know what I'm saying? Like, we all go through trauma. We get traumatized. Society in and of itself is traumatizing. And so there's something about trauma. I don't want to get. I'll get technical for like thirty seconds. Like, mm -hmm. our central nervous system tightens up. We get that fight. We get that fight or flight. Right. So it's like mm -hmm. fight, flight, or freeze too. So what happens mm -hmm. is that if you're constantly in situations where you're being, tra where there's trauma happening, do I gotta fight, mm -hmm. do I gotta run? Do I gotta fight, do I gotta run? Your body remains in this almost perpetual state of anxiety and, and responses. And so your nervous system is wired to just, to just con con be in chaos and constantly don't know what to do. So it happens when you're in, the, it, ha it happens a lot when you're in the hood. So that's the, Look them over your shoulder. That's you know, tight black men sort of like walk past each other, like what's up? You know what I'm saying? I think everyone knows what it means when you see black men out in the street, and it's just mm -hmm. me and you. I'm dark skin and I'm big. If I'm just like walking the street, I sense the like, just thirty seconds of initial like, like you know what I'm saying? Like checking, mm -hmm. checking everyone out, checking what's good. You feel me? Like it's just constantly, constantly happening, and that's just like big picture being in a society with like police school system, healthcare, jobs, losing jobs. The black yeah. male homelessness rate in LA is trash. You feel me? Like um, black women in healthcare, it's bad. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just constantly all these things. And then you just drop it down to your personal family. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, Antonio was right about zero to five and seeing a bunch of things. They assume black boys can just are okay and that they can yeah. just handle shit. You know what I'm saying? It is, well, he's fine. Antonio's right. fine. What? We'll be okay. Yeah. You feel me? Like it, it's it's crazy. You know what I'm saying? And black girls don't even get treated like girls. You know what I'm saying? You know how we have a thing mm -hmm. about girls, we gotta treat them like black girls don't even get treated like girls mostly. You know what I'm saying? It's it's yeah, it's a wild, it's a wild, it's a wild thing to do, man. And even for myself, I I lost my I lost my little bro. My little brother, he got killed, he got murdered some gang violence, right? So mm -hmm. And I mean, I think those are common stories sometimes. Those are common stories. But to actually sit with this idea that I like, I lost somebody to violence. Can we curse on here? I don't know if we can curse on here. Uh, we, okay, cool. yeah. Yeah, I cuss. I didn't know. I didn't know. I, was, I, want, I, want, I want to keep it to what y'all what y'all do. Nah, man, yeah, man, that's what we This is a no judgment zone, man. Be, be you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it fucked me up. Like, the death, the loss, you know, like I got beat up bad by my biological father. And then like, he left at 12. I never seen him again. I don't remember what he looks like. So all mm -hmm. these things reverberate in my head, like being, being beat, being pushed around. You know what I'm saying? All these things, it, it, it affects how, how men interact with each other. It affects how I treat my woman. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It affects like, like how I interact in society, it's just, it's, it's, it's a very crazy thing. So it is mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. us, it is on us to like, I think, to yeah. figure out how to heal. It is on us to figure out how to heal with each other. How like black women and black men can heal with each other. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like how, how we can figure out how to be, be for each other, ease each other's suffering. You feel me? So uh, that's just, that's just, that's just my energy. So. No doubt. Yes, you are talking my language. And, and I think that's, 
the that's what attracted me to your platform was your your um your men trauma circles is that seeing that you yeah. guys meet on a bi-weekly basis it's hard yeah. enough as a woman who's been in you know relationship with only black right. men it's hard enough for a woman who is like uber sensitive and i i can instinctly feel when something is off with my partner and i'm trying yeah. to talk to him about it and he doesn't feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable with me as his partner so to see you hold a platform where you can make space for other black men yeah. a how and b salute like that is dope af how did that come yeah. about <sighs> The how is crazy because let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Black men, we don't do this. We just don't do it. We don't do it. We don't no. do it. Whatever. I promise you. It's it's it just was like for me, praise God, you feel me? I just was like, I was at I'm I do like a little part-time thing at this counseling center in South Central, right? And mm -hmm. we was like, well, let's just do this black male trauma group. It was like three people, two people, <laughs> four people. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I told myself, you know, Vic, it's not on me to be like the celebrity person. It's not on me. That's not, it's not, if, it, if I'm checking my ego and, and dying to myself, am I doing it for accolades? And maybe part of me did want that. Maybe part of me wanted to be like, look at me, look what I'm doing for the community, you know? But then I had mm -hmm. to sort of like, just like, to sort of like die to my ego and be like, I'm just going to show up and be consistent. That's it. If you want, pull up. You feel me? Simple as that. Pull up if you can. If you can't, that's cool too. Yeah. You feel me? I'll be here every Saturday. I'll be here every other Saturday. Um, and at the time, it was before the pandemic. And so it was like once a month. So it was like one Saturday a month, like in person for like two hours. And then once the pandemic hit, we just moved it to like bi-weekly. And it just, people kept coming. And so now there's like a consistent 10 people, 10 guys that come to the, to the oh. Zoom meeting. So that, it's a consistent 10. It's a consistent like seven to 10. We have like a group chat. Yeah. Pop in, you feel me? And it's the same. Anybody can pull up. It don't, it don't matter. I'm just, for me, it's just like, it's just for the people. It's not, it's just for, not about me. And sometimes it's very, sometimes it feels very barbershoppy. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes it's super therapy-ish and sometimes it's just talking shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it just, it, 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 it runs the gambit. And I just sort of facilitate and push and push when we need to push and just like get men, get people to open up. And you, the stories come, the stories come. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. black, men are, black men are holding a lot in. We holding a lot in. Yeah. 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 So, mm -hmm. so, so the thing that I was thinking of when we were explaining, you know, your, your platform and what you're doing with these groups, I took place yeah. in a webinar a couple of days ago talking about um, health and racial disparities amongst black people and some of the things that take place. So I mentioned, you know, me being in the public school system and, and the treatment and how my, the, it what got me into the journey of being in higher ed and to pay it for it. Um, do you feel that we need more, because that's what the webinar was talking about, that we need more black people, black men, black women in those spaces where they're you know, therapists, where there are doctors and nurses, where they can treat and diagnose the situation because they may have it shared it through a lived experience or they may have a family member rather than then someone else that's not from the community doing it. And you see probably the biggest thing is us not wanting to take the vaccination with the COVID-19 being out, right? So mm -hmm. like we have a yeah. history with that. There's a reason behind that. Yeah. So I just want to know more about that. Yeah, I Amir, I think um, brother Amir speaking the gospel. You feel me? <laughs> like he's speaking the gospel right now. Like we don't have a trust for healthcare system, and no. we don't have a trust for therapy, and with good reason, and with good reason. You feel me? And with good reason. Mm -hmm. Like so, I'll tell you off top. Like ODD, oppositional defiance disorder, is something that's put on black boys very early on in the system, like in school. Let one of these black boys start having an attitude or doing having a behavior, they'll slap them with some ODD diagnosis. And there's a history of that. There's a history of that. They're just being, up. they don't actually treat trauma in the boys. They don't actually treat what's going on. They don't do with other kids, other schools, they'll get all types of crazy therapy. 
Let me tell you. So, so uh, let, let me answer your question first before I go off. I tend to go off in tangents too. So, uh, y'all gonna have to bring me back when I go off. Good, bro. You You're good. my family. Amir does the same yeah. thing. Shout out to Amir. <laughs> <laughs> bro, I just be having a million thoughts in my head. G, so I feel you. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 because there's a history of us not being, not having access to the healthcare, and then when we get in there, they don't. We, um, we're get, we get mistreated. We don't get the right care. It makes sense that we have a distrust. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's imperative that we have more Black kings and queens in these positions, therapists, mm-hmm. doctors, et cetera. Because I see the difference. I see the difference when they see mm-hmm. me versus when they see somebody else. Like, I see the difference. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, and also, it's also people who are in the positions learning how to be for black people. Because what happens in therapy school when I got my master's in clinical psychology, they don't teach me how to be a black therapist. They teach me how to be a white therapist. You feel me? Mm. Like, Tell teaching- me more. Like, huh? What do, you, what do you mean by that? Can we can we unpack that a little bit? Yeah, that's what I, yeah, I, I, I had, Please unpack that because I, I they talked about that in the webinar. So please, thank you for asking that. Oh, sure. dope. That's a good follow up. Yeah. That's dope. Yeah, that's dope. This is what they'll do. At baseline, if it comes to like black people or people of color, what they'll do is that, which is dope, they'll be like, so here's what you, here's some modalities to do when you work with the, this demographic, right? So if you work with black people or you work with Mexicans, you work with Japanese, like here is some things about that culture or some things you may need to learn, or here's some things to like look out for, blah, blah, blah. So they might have some ideas or anecdotes about what to do in working with diverse communities, right? What they're completely unaware of is that the what they're what they're actually teaching me is a theory that was created by a white man, that was created however many years ago, that was created by a white man that lived during this time and made this kind of money and did not experience racism. And even philosophically, it's very European. You know what I'm saying? Like African roots are collectivist, communal. European roots are very individualistic. So they're going to teach you how to treat an individual, but miss what it means to be in a communal society. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, so, yes. So, so, yeah, 100%. So they don't teach, so they don't even know it, but they're trying to teach me how to be a therap- white male therapist or a white therapist. And it's honestly, this is the extra work that anybody who is a therapist or healthcare or even an artist, even or even artists, I'm sure if you if you're in high education, Amir, like it's the same thing. Like you got we have to do the extra work of translating one, two other materials to figure out what does it m- mean for me to be a black therapist, a black male therapist, right? Yes. Not only black male, a black male masculine presenting therapist. Like like all these things I have to figure out what it what it means for me when I step into a room. Like what I'm bringing to the table. And for me, it tends to be, I'm very communal. I'm very communal. I believe mm-hmm. in the, I believe, I believe in the group dynamic. I believe in um, that if you're not okay, I'm not okay. Yeah. And that there mm-hmm. is a responsibility we have to each other. Whereas most therapists wouldn't say that. Most therapists would say, the only responsibility you have is to yourself. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And I don't, mm-hmm. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't fully agree. Like you do have to, you, you do, you do have a responsibility to yourself, but you also have, a responsibility to your brother and to your sister. Yes. Like, you feel me? Like, mm-hmm. and we're in this shit together. Point blank, yes. period. And if you, and we're only gonna relieve, we're only gonna get out of this suffering is if I help, if I relieve your suffering and you relieve mine. You know what I'm saying? And so, but and that's, that's not something that they'll teach you in, in therapy school. Let me yeah. tell you that. They're not gonna no, teach that's you real, that. That's real, that's shit right there. Could you, real quick, that yeah. OP, OPD, could you elaborate on what that acronym is again? OBD. OBD. Okay. Oppos- yeah. Oppositional defined disorder. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. you talking about that? It made me think about when I was growing up, and the defiant part. So for me, teachers who were mostly all white growing up would tell my parents, "Amir disrupts the class." That was always what Amir did, but not focusing on Amir's good grades, right? Being that Amir mm-hmm. was in a magnet program coming out of private school. Yeah. So my mom had yeah. to come to the campus to explain to them, you're giving my son a limited opportunity here. 
amongst his peers mm-hmm. and he can hold his weight. But they were so quick to say that he's defiant. He talks a lot in class. All kids talk a lot mm-hmm. in class when you're at a certain age, especially young boys. We don't mature yeah. the same way that our female counterparts do in grade school. So well, like, I can talk well. to my friends growing up and they'll tell you shit up. Amir was funny in class. He was very talkative. But for the teacher, mm-hmm. for this young black boy, it was he's defiant. He disrupts the class. Ooh. But next to my grade was a B, sometimes an A, sometimes, you know, but I it was always that on the report card. It would that was always the focal point. And I remember my English teacher in high school, Miss Elliot, my freshman year, flat out told my dad I did not know Amir had a father. And my father Are you kidding in. me? My father went in, the Compton went in. The Compton came out. And those are the things that I remember growing up. I remember a, 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 a math teacher of mine who uh, told me one time, I, I played basketball in high school, right? And, you know, before practice, we'll, you know, clean the floor. I remember he told me, oh, you're getting prepared to do what you're going to do after you get out of high school, huh? So me being who I am, I cussed him out. I didn't, you know, wow. that was the energy I was feeling at the time. And, you know, it got real heated. And my mom, once again, you know, shout out to the black moms. She had to, you know, intervene. But I told her what happened and she called him out. Like, you can't talk to my son like that. But that was a reoccurring theme with a lot of the young black men that I grew up with growing up in the city. Yeah. So yeah. your what you just outlined, I've never heard of this before. Yeah. Another thing that used to get thrown around a lot, a lot uh, amongst black boys was attention deficit disorder that was another one that yeah. they would throw out right so just to right. know that that is something that gets tossed around and then they will group us as you mentioned amongst other black folk but they're not helping yeah. the situation by just grouping us together nope. and then you have a white teacher trying to delegate what needs to be done so those experiences didn't hinder me but i realized as i'm older now like those were experiences that may have me stand offish in certain situations or may have me blow up right so That's i appreciate fact, you breaking that down man that was deep right there thank you yeah man hey amir i'm gonna tell you something brother i'm sorry that happened to you bro that's fucked up yeah i'm gonna be honest with you dude right. like like i mean like i'm gonna just be real bro that what they feed us about ourselves is trash. Like, Ooh. like, man. But if he's about ourselves is trash, man. Like, I'm promise you, you you leave it up to media, social media, and and TV and society, they'll have you feeling like you ain't nothing, you're a piece of shit. And yeah. they keep telling us that, like, like we're not good, we're not good enough. You know what I'm saying? They keep telling men that, even though men posture like we're fine, we're tough. I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I most of the black men don't believe that. I promise you, they can say right. what they want to say. I've been I've been in the sessions with them. I've been in the session with with game bangers. I've been in the sessions. It's the same. It's the same old, same old. What they tell me in session is different than what they go out and put put on put on put on the gram. You know, what they put with their homies. I promise you. I promise you. The world wants to tell us that we're nothing, bro. You feel me? It wants to tell you, you that you're but, nothing. So bro. I'm gonna hit you like that. That's fucked up. You feel it me? is, but at the end of the day, Vic, I got the last laugh because I'm walking around with the masters in education. So shout Tell out to all the teachers. Me, shout out to the uh, ABC Unified School District. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm I'm walking around with letters behind my name. So yeah, hey, man. Straight, up. straight up, straight up. A lot Amen, of this bro. stuff, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about came from as a result of the crack ac- epidemic. Straight up. Right. And so most of these diagnoses came as a result of crack babies, unfortunately. You know what I'm saying? And so that is it's, true. it's really sad that that you know that we had to suffer the results of what the government did to communities. Like, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I mean, I'm just I just had to add that. Crack act with that. Yep, that's a fact. I think that's another reason why um, I love what you're doing because you are breaking the, the generational dysfunction. I feel like starting with the head, the black man is the head mm. of our community. And if we don't get mm. them back in their rightful positions, our community will never heal. And I get it. Like there's collective healing that needs to have, but it has to start with the head and trickle down. Right. Like the, Can I, I ask you, Sharon? Yeah. I was about to say, because you said the black man is the head of the community. What 
do you feel that's a popular sentiment these days among that black I'm among not. black women? Among black women, you said the black men's the head of the community. Do you feel like that is a popular sentiment among black women or not? No, it's been I, a long time since I've heard a black woman say that. No, no, no. So what I said was we got to get them back to the head because that's that's where that was the rightful rightful position. That's how it started. But due right. to the the crack epidemic, due to mass incarceration, the woman had to mm -hmm. you know hold what I don't know mm -hmm. the word, but take lead in, in the household and be the mom and the father. So what I'm saying yeah. is with your group, you are, you know, breaking the, the dysfunction yeah. and getting men back to the rightful position as as the head. Do I yeah. personally believe that the black man is the head? Yes. Do I personally believe that I need the black man to survive? Hell the fuck yes. So for me personally, I can't do it on my own. I don't I don't want to do it on my own and I don't profess that I can. Shout out to all the women who are, but I personally I'm choosing to live my life with a partner, a black yeah. male partner. Yeah. Oh. No doubt, no doubt. Woo. Yeah, and then in addition to that, Vic, like like what you've been sharing, you basically did the the, the work, man. You mm -hmm. did the work in order to sit, sit in front of people such as myself, such as yeah. you know, people in my peer group to yeah. To, to add value to some of the some of the stress and the strife that we've gone through in life. You know what I'm saying? You did the work. And it's, yeah, it's a lot of times like like um we're less likely to respect people that don't look like us, like us. Straight up. I'm less likely to respect somebody that's that's not from the hood like I'm from the hood. Yeah. Right. And not saying that I won't respect, but I'm it's gonna be a little struggle. You know what I'm saying? And that was right. that was one of the things that I had re regarding religion coming up. Yeah. Luckily, because I went to private school, so it was all nothing but white men teaching religion, right? But when I went to church on Sunday, I saw a man that looked like me talking about God, right? Yeah. So historically, yeah. they say that 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 Christianity was given to to slaves in order to help them behave while they mm. were slaves. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I've always battled with that, but at the same time, because my mom put me in private school, so I wouldn't be out here gangbanging. I'm looking at the white man telling me what to do. But when I went to church on Sunday, mm -hmm. I had I had a difference of a, of a view and it yep. was more it was more rewarding to me coming from a black preacher. I won't listen to a lot of these white preachers today just for, just because of that. Mm. <laughs> nah, that's really Shout out to Joe Osteen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't watch him. Uh, <laughs> Joe Osteen and then uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland. Oh, yeah, but 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 true part about it is gonna be real transparent. My mom watched 44, uh, channel 40, yeah, yeah. yeah. right, you know, Trinity Broadcast oh, Network. Oh, I think bro, all like, you I'd be like, Mom, you tripping? I ain't watch. I think, I think all black households at some point would see their grandmother. I remember, you know, rest of rest her soul, but she used to watch TV and on the regular. What was the name of the preacher? He had all white hair, and his wife had that purple pinkish hair. Had like a Baker. dollar apartment. Y'all know who I'm talking about. The Bakers. The Bakers. Now, not the ba Well, the Bakers was one of them. There, there was another one that was like the mainstays of TBN. You know what I'm talking about. I know you're the talking about. had the wild hair. Yeah. yeah I know you're talking about. I thought that was uh, I can't think of their last name. Now, it was another one. It's not yeah. Baker. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not, is it Crouch? Not about. Crouch. No, Crouch. Yeah. I know you're talking about. The head of the TBN people, the main couple. I know you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, you know what, Char? I think you may have been on it. It was uh, Paul and Jan Crouch. Yeah. Yep. Really? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. And she had that purple, pink, wild hair. Yeah. And um, yeah, yep, that's them. Damn. Yeah, that was them. I remember them like back in the day. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and and you know and and that location is still there, but it doesn't operate anymore, of course. But um, that building is still there. But I used to get a kick out of them, you know, back in the day. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's them. I remember them back in the day. My, you know, my grandma used to. But uh, now nah, that's real talk, though, Tori. I think for black folk, that the black church has always been the escape for us and. That yeah. was the only time on Sunday that we can actually be ourselves, 
you know, and that goes yeah. back to when we weren't enslaved, to be honest with you. You know what I'm saying? That was the only time that the master would allow us. And even then, we were still being told what we can do. And, you know, there's a rich history amongst Black folk in the Black church, but that's a conversation for another day, maybe another show, a segment, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll elaborate yeah. on yeah, because you know, you know, I love to, 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 to dissect the black church, yo. You know, I love to, but shout out to mine, Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia, where my pastor will tell people it is okay to have Jesus and a therapist. So, shout out. Oh, yeah, most definitely. That's that's so, but but let me bring up the, the concept about men and crying. Now, mm. I, I've always, um, I've always process this in, in a different way because I was always an emotional person. Uh, I always expressed my emotions rather. And so as, as a youngster crying, I look at crying as that that's that's a human trait. Like we all have emotions, right? Right. Right. So we all have emotions. No matter no matter and, and I think it's up to to those who are like our 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 parents and our, our aunts and sisters and uncles and all they need to know what it's like or they need to know how to be more supportive to people who do express emotions, especially as kids, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Because, okay, it's okay to cry, but after you cry, you're going you're gonna to continue being strong. Yep. After you get punched in the mouth, you're going to continue either you're going you're gonna to protect yourself or you're going to hit them first next time. You know what I'm saying? You're going yeah. gonna, to gonna be able to help someone instead of saying, stop crying. You know, I'm going to give you something to cry yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? So then, and I saw a meme that kind of related to this. The woman was saying, stop crying before I give you something to cry about. And then later in life, she's like, well, why aren't you being expressive? Yep. That's a bar. That's so I just want I want to throw that out so to see what you had to say about it a little bit, you know. I um <clears throat> you know what's funny when he was talking was I thought about this. You know who the most emotional men are, bro? Game bangers. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Oh, I, don't know, I don't know. <laughs> bro, I don't know. I don't know anybody who's more emotional than a homie who's game banging. I promise you. Every little slight, every little thing, they be mad. I promise you. I'll be like, bro, why are you so mad? Right. Every little thing. Turned up. But, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? So, for mm -hmm. me, it's weird to say because I find black men to be highly emotional. You know what mm. I'm saying? To be highly emotional. I don't understand this idea that we're not. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're highly emotional. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how many game bands I know. They cry all the time, bro. It's just tears all the time. And granted, too, it's different when you, like, lost a lot of people. When you have people are dying, like, I get, like, it gets it gets funny. But um, I, would, I would argue that we're extremely emotional. It's just we pretend like we're not. It's just so it's weird to me. It's like this weird, like, what are we talking about? Of course, people cry all the time. But what the problem is, it's communicated for us to not cry, is my thing. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm a deeply feeling emotional person. And not, mm -hmm. I stand in my power in that now, but it was harder when I was a kid, right? It was harder mm -hmm. when I was a kid. And then I went through a phase of I never cried for like 20 some odd years. And I just like, I don't cry. I'm not good. I'm not doing that shit. But that wasn't really me. That was just me yeah. saying I don't do that. Truth is, I'm a deeply feeling person. I love people deeply. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I care deeply. And now I'm more self-actualized. So I'm okay with that. Like I'm I that's where my power is at. You know what I'm saying? Loving my people, okay. loving and love loving my brothers, you know what I'm saying? Love, loving my sisters. Like I know that's where my power is at. So I'm okay. I'm okay with it now. If it if tears come, they come. If they don't, yeah. they don't. Because I feel like there's there's, I find that there's power in releasing that and being with people. Like, yeah. So, I know I'm jumping again. I know I'm jumping again. I think, I think that th there's this one level where it's like, protect yourself, right? And or, what can I do to get attention? What can I do to get attention from women? What can I do to get it to get money? What can I do to be popping? What can I do with this? And then I think there's a level above that which says I throw up the white flag and I surrender and I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight you anymore. Mm -hmm. I just want to love you, bro. You feel me? I want you to live. And for me, mm -hmm. that's why I try my best to exist. Like, I just want my people to live, man. I just want them to have peace. 
know what I'm saying? I want yeah. that peace. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want my, I want my, I want black girls and black children to be okay, man. I don't want yeah. people to be poor. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I try my best to release, like, I need to be this, I need to be that. I, I, I just want to be with you. You feel me? So, yeah. like, for me, it's like that. You know what I'm saying? So I can't speak to anybody else, but I don't know if that answers any questions. Sort of. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was on point, man. That was on point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Listen, crying is my is my default mechanism. I, I love to cry. I cry when I'm happy. I cry when I'm sad. I cry when I'm confused. It's, it's a release for me. It's just like um, running or having an orgasm. It's just it's just another form of release. And I think we need mm. to normalize tears. Well, no, yeah. Well, for me, it's always gospel music, some old school gospel music. I actually listened to some this morning before I started my day. So that always gets me going growing up in the church. And I was listening to uh, Lord Make Me Right. That's an old school gospel classic right there. Oh, uh, hey, bro. Ooh, you, you took you it back. The gospel, bro. Ooh, that's bass choir level. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yeah, that that right there. You turn that on up on loud. And you know, you get that you get that full on choir, it's a wrap. Yep. So shout out, yeah, shout out to to old school gospel music, you know, going back, you know. That's that's the heart and soul of our community. But um Hey bro, that's me too. I'm a big gospel music kid. I, I'm a big gospel music kid. So you ain't you ain't saying nothing but yeah. Kids, man. I, yeah. Right, right, right. That's dope. Yeah, you still so Vic. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just and trying to say that. In, in, in relate to uh, in relation to what you're saying, Shar, about tears, I on a couple occasions occasions saw my mom crying, and I asked her like, well, at least one time, asked her, "Hey, mom, what's going on?" And she was like, "I was like, are you sad?" She was like, "No, these are tears of joy." Mm. I was like, I was blown away from that because how can you express? You know, it looks like she was sad, but yet she would tell me, and maybe she was trying to protect me. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, she redirected my by saying. It was, this is tears of joy, and I was like, "Wow, tears of joy! They they are a thing. They they are completely a thing." I've I've been so speaking of gospel music, I've been so caught up in just like gratitude and thankfulness to where I've shed major tears. So, yeah. like I said, for me, crying is just it's it's my go to if I'm happy, sad, confused. It just it brings after I cry, after I get a good cry out. I'm good. I'm at peace. That's dope. That's exactly what it is. At the end of the day, it is peace, having peace. And I truly hope that, and I think it's something that's like a reoccurring thing that we mention all the time on our podcast is, you know, we hope that all people, you know, can come out of this victorious, but within the Black community, especially, that they're taking time to heal within their own and in their families and you know, that's why, you know, we got to give a shout out to these virtual um, platforms that allow us to connect. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can build that community. So what you're doing, Vic, and what we're doing here as a collective, you know, the the shout out to technology, you feel me? The, the yeah. applications that are out there that allow us to touch one another um, within our community is definitely key, you know, no doubt. Um, you know, so... Um, we're going to go ahead and keep pushing. Um, Wait, hold on. I have, I have one more question. For, yeah. I have a, another question for Vic. Um, what was your, in your, in your personal journey, what was your, what was the moment of reckoning where you felt like you knew you needed help and you knew that you couldn't deal with your trauma on your own? Mm -hmm. um, Cause I feel like in a healing process, there's, there's always this awakening where you realize within yourself, like, it does not have to be like this. Like there is another side of trauma and pain. So what was it that brought you to seeking help for yourself? Um, first of all, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. It's cool, cool. Um, it's a hard, it's, it's, it's a difficult question for me to like answer partially because things happened and it wasn't until like years later, which I start to feel them if that makes any sense. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like something happened and then I started dealing with the effects of it like a week afterwards. Mm -hmm. Something happened yeah. when I was a kid and I didn't feel it till I was 20. Yeah. Right. right? Like, like, so for me, I was just sort of like existing. Um, and so like, I think like around 25, 
something like that. Like, I just was stuck. And I'm gonna be honest with you, trauma, trauma is interesting because uh, your trauma memory is weird because when you're traumatized, it's like, I was five, I was 10, I was 20. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And you have these like huge gaps and you're like, what, what was I doing? Like people who have went through trauma tend to have like these huge gaps where I don't, like I truly struggled remembering like I was this age and I was this age. I was like huge jumps. I don't remember my yeah. 20s and I met you in my 20s. <laughs> yeah, you know I'm saying I met you. My yeah. I don't remember my twins. You know what I'm saying? Really? I, I'm trying to remember, like, what, what? I promise you, I'm like, what was happening in my twenties? What was I doing? So I do know at some point during that time I was stuck, uh-huh. and and then I was like, I'm not gonna do no fucking therapy. I'm not gonna do that. But I ended up going to see, like, I don't know if you, I don't know if you ever saw, because me and Shar went to the same church in Inglewood. Um, mm-hmm. his name was Doctor Polite. He was a church, the, the psychologist at Faithful Central, and he was a black man. Um, okay. and, then, and I went to go see him. Um, and that was like the first, probably one of the first times, like, I just like, A, I don't have a father. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't have a dad. Mm-hmm. This is a black man who just was like speaking into me, listening to me. And mm-hmm. it's probably like one of my father figures. And it ended up just being like, almost like a mentor relationship. Even after we were done with sessions, like I, I would get to call him and like text him, you know what I'm saying? And I'm sure some of that like broke like quote unquote therapy rules, but him being like mm-hmm. an older black man and just like giving me game and just speaking to my life and just listening to my shit was powerful for me at the time. And and I think it just was, I was just I just was stuck, man. Nothing was moving. I didn't know, I didn't know, I wasn't happy. You know, and then I just basically realized in that process, I had basically been depressed since I was like three or two years old. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Low level, like low level, not this over, not this super dramatic thing, but this low level of depression, which basically kept me at this weird, unmotivated, like unmotivated, just walking through life, like sort of like skimming through life, like, oh, I don't know, you know, just. Mm-hmm. Not motivated, not knowing what I, not knowing what to do, kind of stuck. I found myself in my room, not leaving my room like for days at a time, mm-hmm. and that was just random. That was so common that I didn't realize I knew it was happening. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's that. And then it was just like unlocking all the shit, all the abuse, all the violence I experienced, all the all the suffering, all the pain, all the anger I had towards my both my mother and my father. And also just some of the gratitude I have for people who took me in, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Some, of that, some of that came up as well. Um, yeah, so so it was less than a, an, an one event, it was more an amalgamation of events and then mm-hmm. me realizing I was feeling stuck in my mm-hmm. life. And then mm-hmm. in that way, you know what I'm saying? So. That's interesting, because on the outside looking in, I would never guess because, you know, we were a part of the same Bible study, so you yeah. were always open you were always willing to share you were always vulnerable about your you know whatever was on your heart at that time and you were always like loving and happy towards everybody like you made everybody feel welcome so it's it's interesting to hear on the you know it's the whole check on your strong friends thing that goes that people go around now it's a whole it's a whole idea it's that check on your strong friends it's that it's that idea i'm a natural protector and caretaker you know what i'm saying so i'm going to like nurturer caretaker protector like and so i find i just like being with people right i like being with people mm-hmm. and being for people and i think it's also just one of the things like it's diff- i can't say i think when i was younger i'd be on that whole like i help everybody else no one helps me type thing mm-hmm. like i'm there for everybody else no one's there for me and that was kind of true but now I realize it was also it was I have to take accountability for how I behave with people. Like I isolated myself. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? I uh was I removed myself from people. I yeah. hid and I didn't give people opportunity to be there for me. You know what I'm saying? Whether or not they could or whether they would not is neither here nor there. I didn't give people because I didn't know how to, bro. I was scared, I was in fear. I didn't, I, I never really felt like I fit with everybody. So I just sort of like hid myself away. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And now I realize that it was a lie. 
Mm -hmm. people, a lot of people love me. That's that's what's been powerful for me now is that deeply loved by a lot of people. And yeah. once I like locked in with that, as opposed to the narrative that no one loves me, I realized that a lot of people do. Now, maybe we're not super close, friends talk all the time type shit. Yeah. But even your energy, Char, like that's love to me. You feel me? Like it's not like, oh, I've talked to you, I haven't talked to you in 10 years. My point is that yeah. people think highly of me and have mm -hmm. good thoughts about me and care with however the degree of care it is. Maybe it's a little bit, maybe it's mm -hmm. high. But that to me has been powerful to just like be able to step back and release the narrative that people don't love me and step into mm -hmm. this like, people that have like cared about me, given themselves to me, and have really like like affirmed me, you know what I'm saying? And that's been that's been that's been the thing. Mm, yeah, like that. It's a, it's a blessing. It's a blessing when we don't look like what we've been through. Yeah, straight up. Man, right. Straight up. I hear you preaching the gospel, and Tony. I hear you, bro. Right. <laughs> Listen, Tony. Came through with the bar. Came through with the bar. To talk, yo. Yeah, man. Real. Wow, that is so true. That is so true. Wow. I don't even know how to segue from here. Well, but I'm loving this conversation. Like I could I could literally just have this conversation <laughs> with y'all all day. No, yeah. Yeah, man. We appreciate you taking this time. So well, the best way to segue from here is to do our usual sound off. <laughs> sound off, sound off. So if y'all got some heat, you know, bring it bit. If you got some sound off heat. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we brought this up earlier. That Kevin Samuels joint. Right. <laughs> I need to, I have not had a chance to talk about it with nobody, really, because I just been Wait, so bro, this is the platform to do it. Bring it, bring it. I don't bro, let me tell you something. I, I was shook. I saw that video, I was shook, bro. And I was like, oh, I was like, what the, what is this? <laughs> I was like, oh Lord, what's what's going on? I was like, I I, I know the sound like I, uh, it was crazy, man. It was crazy. It's so weird and controversial. It brought so much shit for me. Can I be honest with you? It brought so much personal shit. It yeah. brought so much personal. And I think it's probably be viral. So I think it's touching on something which my professor would say is speaking to like the collective unconscious. Like there's something that that video is touching <laughs> that's in the unconscious of black people that like we're not kind of dealing with. I think part of it is black male anger, black males not being seen and acknowledged and also black women being like black women like wanting more, you know what I'm saying? Wanting more from us, but also wanting more from themselves. But I think it's also, our so personally I have struggled in the past year and this isn't like healthy. I've struggled with my anger towards black women. Like it's risen the past year. like. Not in a way, not in something I feel like it's healthy too. And I just saw myself into my, why am I? Can we huh? unpack that? What's, what's going on? Unpack For that. Sure. Unpack that a little bit. Um, 100%, 100%. I didn't know. So I should say that I was a therapist and at, at this um place in Compton, it was a sexual assault crisis center it was down the street from mm -hmm. my house, right? Um, And I would go there and do therapy with sex, survivors of sexual assault woman off the street on Long Beach doing day work, you know what I'm saying? And just mm -hmm. coming to That's therapy. Long Beach. Yeah, yeah, Long Beach Boulevard. Not Long Beach, but Long Beach Boulevard. Okay. You know what I'm a lot of workers, sex workers, you know what I'm yes. saying? I, yes, that's, that's right, right, right by my church. I know that very, yeah. You know what's up. You already know yeah. what's up. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I was ingrained in dealing with black woman coming to see me, a black male, who might remind them of someone who beat them up, raped them, et cetera. So I was mm -hmm. in this place of like deep connection with black women and feeling their pain and suffering and how difficult and mistreated they are. That passed. More recently, I kept hearing this, black men are trash, niggas ain't shit. Mm -hmm. And it just kept reverberating again and again. And I kept seeing, I saw someone say, Black men are the white people of black people. I was like, what's going on, man? And it just kept, and after a while, I felt like I was getting beat down, like socially, like through the world. I'm like, are black, what's up with black women right now? So it felt <laughs> like I kept getting beat, beat up, beat up, beat up. 
and I got frustrated, man. And so my and so what happened? I started having these in conversations. I'm part of it because of social media. It's not a good idea to have conversation on social media. I'm like over yeah. there. It's over with. But listen, it was as if I could not even offer a critique or feedback to black women before they launched into some. I thought white feminist. I saw. I thought it was white feminism is what I would say. I thought it was. It, it would launch into something. But then I realized that's come from a place of hurt, anger. From so I was trying to hold. I was trying to hold that it was like frustrations with black men, them working it out. But at some point, it just became too much, and also it started to feel like I could never say anything, and it felt like I could never offer feedback or hold black women accountable. But I was supposed to sit there and just take that I was. A really bad person, um, and so, but when I look at the statistics, I see black men are vulnerable, the most vulnerable to incarceration, to police brutality, to homelessness, mm -hmm. um, unemployment, and higher education. All things which are very specific to black men. But mm -hmm. I felt that we weren't getting acknowledged for how difficult it is for us to be to live life, and so it started to feel like. I'm supposed to take care of, I'm supposed to protect black women, but I can't say, tell them anything. I'm supposed to make sure I have a big dick and fuck them good, but I also have to make sure I, <laughs> I have to make sure like I, I hold, I, I'm super nice and massage and massage their shoulders. I'm supposed to be super sweet, but super strong. I'm supposed to make a lot of money and be a thug. But I'm not supposed to be right there. I'm also supposed to be able to love Jesus and, 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 and preach the gospel. But it felt like I was supposed to do a million things. <laughs> All of which I realized, I don't think I can do all these things. And part of it was just not even, it wasn't fair to black women and how angry I was getting at them. It wasn't fair to them. That's that's real. That was just a lot of my frustration. But there was also truth. So going back to the Kevin Samuels thing, I thought it was crazy that she came in there talking about, I want a six-figure man. I was like, yo. <laughs> I, was like, I, was like, I was like, yo, what is this? What is this? And then, and then to, and then to hear him talk to her felt kind of wild. There was truth in it, but somebody's how he said. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't have talked to her like that. You know what I'm saying? Me being there, but it's not like the energy I would have brought to her. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I can't front that. It felt, it felt weird. It felt like it was truth, but it also felt like kind of wrong at the same time. I don't know. Yeah. I want to hear. I want. I want to know what you guys thought because I've been like. This has been in my head for like the past week. I couldn't talk. I haven't talked about it with anybody. So. Yeah. So, so have you seen the entire? Did you see only the clip, or did you watch? Because there's there's more to it that adds context to the conversation. So did you only see what was circulating on World Star? I just saw what was. I just saw the clip. I just saw the clip. Okay. I didn't see the full interview. No. Okay. In in Kevin Samuel's defense, and I understand he's hard to defend. In his defense. He tried to have the conversation with the young lady offline. Like, cause the episode was not even about what she was calling in for. It was about something totally different. Yeah. So he, he tried to have the conversation with her offline. He was like, book a consult with me. I'll help you. Cause he's like an image consultant and he gives people like dating advice yeah. or whatnot. So he tried to have the conversation with her offline. She called in. Yeah. And according to my colleague, According to my, this is my colleague is, is a black male. He said, I feel like Kevin said what we all want to say, but can't. Mm. Or don't have the courage to. Yeah. I, get, it's, it's, I get that his delivery is, is, is whack. It's harsh. I get it. I, I get that it's hard for a lot of women to see a black man approach a, or talk to a black woman in that manner. But there was some truth to what he said. I'm sorry. There was there, there, some, some real oh. truth, <laughs> some real truth. And, and here's the thing. Here's what I want to ask y'all as black men. <laughs> Based on her looks alone, would y'all even entertain the young lady? So, <laughs> no. Hell no. Hell no. Hell no. And hell no. Is she, is she y'all type? Is she y'all okay. type? Oh, no. But there's someone... Thinking. There's somebody for everybody. That's the other. There idea. is, but here's the problem, though. Here's the problem. The problem is, and this is what Vic was alluding to. The problem is, is that the the black women allow social media to dictate their their image or what a black man should be. 
So you have rappers, you have other individuals who come from the community that say, you know, they think they can just build a brother. And it's like, you got the city girls who say they don't want no nine to five nigga. Okay, well, here's the thing. There's a lot of nine to five niggas who have college degrees, they're super educated and they're supporting and raising a whole family with that nine to five. So we have to be careful of the conversation and the, it, it, it vibrates beyond the black community. And then they look at, they look at me, they look at Vic, they look at Antonio and say, oh, this, this, you know, and that's the problem. So when you have a woman coming on a brother's show who focuses on image and helping you create that, and then you get on there and the first thing that comes to your mind is you want a six figure nigga. Okay, well, here's the problem. There, there's, there, there's more layers to that. And the fact that he kept giving her an olive branch to kind of <laughs> help, she dig a hole for herself and basically became viral. And we know what you look like now. And that doesn't help the situation. So unfortunately, she's in, a, she's in, she's in a six figure nigga limbo. Six figure nigga limbo. Ain't no six figure nigga gonna come to you now, sister, because you've been exposed on Kevin Samuels show. I don't even know if, I, to be honest with you, I highly, I don't know if he has or not, but I would love to know if there's like a follow up to what happened between the two of them because Shar introduced us to his platform, but, 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 but damn, like that's the first one out of the many ones that he's done that actually went viral. And you can't do that. Like, that's the problem with us. It's like, it, it, it just, it, it's a fantasy thing that we live in and we just think that automatically that's the way it's supposed to be. And I don't feel bad for people who present themselves in that nature. I don't feel bad for that sister at all because she did that to herself, straight up. Kevin's gonna be Kevin. You, if you can't handle the heat, don't go in the kitchen. A miracle, let me tell you. My issue with the world, my issue with the world is why does trash go viral? Ooh. Because because of the, you know what? It's something that's being created in society where our mindset is we want the quick and the fast and let me get it now. And the thing is, is that trash sells. Stories sell, sex sells, and stories tell. So these mm-hmm. stories allow us to, they, they go viral and then we poke fun at it. And then you see it in reality television, whether it's love and hip hop or real housewives of whatever city or county or country, you know, whatever. That's just the way mm-hmm. America, that's like the new fabric of America in the 21st century. You can you can you yep. can even put the Kardashians in that same line. Is that trash sales? And unfortunately, in our black in the black community, we think that we can align ourselves with that mess and it's okay. But in the meanwhile, they involve themselves in that trash and then they put us as black men a part of that trash. It's like, well, you're not helping. You're not helping. Antonio. Yeah, and so and so, what do you mean by trash sales? If you don't want me asking. Okay, so like 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 trash goes viral. Like when somebody has a fight in the club, goes viral. When yeah. when someone is unattractive, arguing with Kevin, uh, goes viral. Uh, so she it, is unattractive. So she I'm, is unattractive. I mean, not nah, somebody for everybody. That's what that I'm sister is about. unattractive. <laughs> you said what? She's unattractive. Everything about every everything about her was unattractive. Her attitude, the way she presented herself. I'm not even gonna go into the looks. I'll let you decide on that. But I'm talking about the way she presented herself was unattractive. Okay. okay. So yeah. And it doesn't help that she has she came on looking like that, but she self-admitted she's a five. She self-admitted. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> She I said, feel like she I feel like said she did say she she, she did say that it's difficult for me because Ooh. he's an image consultant. <laughs> he's an image consultant, which I gathered. I, started, I, I, started, I watched a couple of his of his things. Right, he's an image consultant. Yeah. I'm a therapist, so I feel just be, with my stance, 
I wouldn't have talked to that sister like that. You know what I'm saying? That's just not me. That was not me. Just not what I would. Not what I would. What I would have done. Right. These image consultants that I see, like his his, like what he what he does. It just the therapist to me was like, oh, was just like it cringed because I'm recognizing the power dynamics at play, and I'm recognizing mm-hmm. like like. It's your platform, so she's in terms of power, like she's gonna be down there a little bit, and so I feel like I would have given, I would have just given space that it's, my, I don't want to embarrass her, you know what I'm saying? Like I'll yeah. give space, that I don't want to make her feel bad. Granted, this is also the consequences to the, some of the choices that she had been making. Like she said, I wanted a six-figure man. The minute you do that. You've now put yourself into a consumer product conversation. You know what I'm saying? Like the minute you did it, you left yourself open for him to be like, well, if you want six figure man, this is what six figure men want. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. six figure men don't care that you make six figures. They don't care if you got a million degrees. They care if you look like this. You know what I'm saying? You having degrees, most men don't, they're not going to care about that. They care if you have A, B, C, D, right? And she's like, a <laughs> So, so the minute she did that, I felt like she was, it was like, I was like, oh, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. But if she had, like, I think to me, if she had moved outside of this, like, I'm this is what I want and made it about something different, then I think he wouldn't have the, um, the space to tell her that type of thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, if it had been about, I want a man who can, I like to be with the man who, like, we can either build or we can partner or mm-hmm. I'm cool if you make like 70, if you're working hard or yeah. if you got in the yeah. Like that's different. And that's a different conversation. But you're talking about yeah. six figure men. Yeah. Yeah. I feel yeah. Like, like, you, like that means you look down on men who make less than you. Thank like, you. So, and, I, and I don't feel bad for her at all. I don't feel bad for her. And I, if you feel bad for that sister, then that's your opinion. But I don't feel bad for her at all for going on a platform. And like like Shar said, it, that wasn't the purpose of that segment on his show for that particular evening. And I don't feel bad for her for what she did. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Kevin Samuels. Yeah, that whole six figure conversation really annoys me, bro. That is, that's whack. That's trash alone. That's but that's uh, so I would say in DC that is the culture. It is it is DC. De- Disgustingly, the culture of me being at a happy hour, minding my own black business, <laughs> and a man leading with, I make six figures. And I'm like, okay, but really? wow. That's cool. That's cool. Are you an, are you emotionally intelligent? Like, okay, but can you hold a conversation? Okay, but what is your name, brother? Like, yeah. why is that your your rebuttal? So that's that's huge out here, and I get it. DC, the salaries are high. People are highly educated, so I get it. Federal government is out here, so people make great money. That's great, but I don't think that you should lead with that, and I don't think that that should define you because you could lose that job and lose those six figures, and then what else do you have? Real no, you can, yeah, you can get, there's a lot of things, consequences with that. Um, I don't know if that was a collective sound off, but I wanted to throw mines out there real quick. Uh, mine, I have one more thing to say about her, but I forgot. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, oh, my last point, you're in North Carolina. <laughs> like, who's making six figures? Not, no shade, but like, who's making six figures in North Carolina? What is North Carolina's industry even known for? I couldn't even. I'd say college. I would say it's probably. So she's an entrepreneur. I would say it's a. She's an entrepreneur, so she worked her way into her six figures. It's not like she's working for an organization that's paying her that. Yeah. So. I was. Why do you even need six figures in North Carolina? Property value is low AF. Right. Well, North Carolina is probably known for agriculture. That would probably be the only thing, and the fact that they got some of the great basketball programs in college. But other than that. Yeah, she, I think if I'm not mistaken, she was like a dog groomer or owns a dog grooming business or something like that. But yeah, yeah, but you know, North Carolina. Um, my sound off on the line of sports is Jamil Hill and Carrie Champion. Um, they had an interview earlier this week on their show that's on Vice. Uh, I believe it's called Stick to Sports, Carrie Champion and Jamil Hill Stick to Sports. 
And a few weeks ago, there was a fight that took place between YouTube sensation Jake Paul and former NBA player Nate Robinson. And the two duked it out in a match, uh, which was under it was on the undercard for the Tyson Jones uh, um, uh, exhibition match. So the question that was asked was, one, did you think it was racist uh, to knock out Nate Robinson? Did you feel that fighting him was racist? And it was just like, okay, you guys are well regarded as sports journalists. You were former ESPN journalists. I have a, a great appreciation for what their platform stand for. But in their, what they said in Jamil Hill, and I'm gonna paraphrase it, is that it was a joke that was in bad taste. And for her, I can poke fun at racism and also speak on it as well, or talk about it. But my thing is, is that the timing of it and where we are right now as a black society, I think it was bad taste. And if you go on their um, Instagram or, or platform and you, you follow them, you can see that a lot of people within the black community, outside the black community went in on them because it's like, you guys don't help the situation by doing it. And, you know, um, I, I don't know if it was some kind of scripted situation, but it was just all bad. And I, I'm just like, you know, come on, you guys, like, there's a lot of other things that you can do with your platform. But to do something like that, it was really distasteful. And I, and uh, I was a little uh, shocked that they did that. And I was like, you know, we gotta do better. We gotta do better. What do you think about Nate's pre preparation for the for this fight? Well, it was an exhibition match. So I don't expect an NBA player to go in the ring with a guy who's a YouTube sensation that actually trains to fight. But to Jake, uh, to his defense, he said that he, Nate Robinson called him out to, for this fight. So it's like, you know, uh, boxing is a technical sport. It's not something that you can just, you know, back in the day, you know, you know, Vic and, and Antonio, you know, growing up back in the day, you throw on the gloves with your boys, you get out there and you have a good time, but throwing in, throwing on the gloves in, in the middle of your street is totally different than throwing on the gloves in the middle of the ring and fighting for two minutes. That, that, that takes a whole nother level of stamina and, and, and sports and, uh, yeah, it was just all bad. So Jamil Hill, Kerry Champion, I love y'all sisters, but don't do that again. Don't do it again. <laughs> stick, stick to sports. Stick to sports. Stick to stick to sports. Don't you know? Save the jokes for the the, the other the other people. Yeah, I also feel like it's we're we're in too sensitive of a time to even bring up race. Like just just don't. Yeah. Unless you're gonna have a courageous conversation with them, don't don't bring up stupid stuff. I think it's the, I think it's one of those message messenger not the message i think someone else could have said that and wouldn't have been that big of a deal i think would have been like oh whatever they're making a joke i think people are sensitive about jamel hill i've seen i think more recently i think jamel hill has said some things which i've found i've taken issue with more recently i think he said something about black men there's been a lot of things i've heard her say about black men which i've just really really thought was inappropriate you know um she's a great sister though great, talented, you know what I'm saying, beautiful sister, like, but there's some things, and so I think that people are sensitive about Jamel Hill right now, because I thought, I could tell, oh, you're just joking, so I didn't know it was going to be, a, like, a big blow, because I was like, oh, she's just joking, she's not, this ain't, this ain't no serious thing, but because I think it's her a little bit, I think people are a little more sensitive. Someone else has said that, they might have just let that ride, you know what I'm saying, like, if Chappelle had yeah. said that, we wouldn't be having this conversation, you know what I'm saying, right. like, because people know it's Chappelle, how he jokes, you know what I'm saying, but it's Jamel Hill, so I think people are kind of like, yo, like, you mean that? You 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 meant that? You know what I'm saying? Like, people are mm -hmm. thinking like, she meant that. so yeah. Um, I think yeah. I I I just I, yeah. Anyways. Now yeah, I feel you, bro. <laughs> go ahead, Antonio. I'm gonna go last. Well, <clears throat> I don't really have a sound off, but I would just like to say, you know, this issue between. The Republicans and the Democrats and people hoping that Trump pulls through and they're hoping that that God somehow makes a way. And it's like it's really annoying to me because because God is for everyone, not just Trump supporters, right? And and Democrats. I mean and Republicans, you know what I'm saying? So I really find I really find this comical and I wish, you know, actually I'll be glad when it's over. You know what I'm saying? So that's all I got to say about that.
Yeah, I um, yeah, I had a conversation with friends last week about profits that they were aware of that are predicting that, or who have prophesied that Trump is going to win, and I'm just like, this is this is way too much. This is this is becoming way too much. <laughs> I'm just gonna like piggyback off of Vic and take the Kevin Samuels clip as as my sound off. I just think that there was some some truth and some validity. Um, I think he was a little harsh, but he's still my guy. He's hilarious. <laughs> hey, I started watching him after that. I was like, this guy is not a game. This guy is not playing games with y'all. <laughs> Did you see the clip? <laughs> he called the guy. He was talking to the dude that called. And said, you got big boots? <laughs> Bro, I was like, <laughs> Yeah, my man has, I don't That's know. The one. That was Bro. Wild. <laughs> my man he, is wild. He, he, he was like, so you telling me, you telling me you fat, you make less than a thousand dollars a month, you ain't even got a you ain't even got no big dick. <laughs> you can't expect women to talk to you. I was like, this guy's. <laughs> Elise is equal opportunity. Elise, Elise, oh, he doesn't discriminate. Right, <laughs> right. He's he's this a whole nother level of if the if the black community were to make like a uh, like a year in review, he's got to be. He has to have a chapter because no yeah. doubt about it. In the black year in review, he he's a, he has a chapter or a page because he's my man. My man is no joke. He is off the chain. Off the chain. Yep. I mean, yep. he takes what he does serious. I mean, you know. <laughs> he really does. He really does. Music playing and all. Incense burning and all. You put on a nice little little jack, little blazer. He'd be ready. I'm waiting for somebody to spoof him. Oh, my gosh, yes. That it's would happening. Now that he's gone viral, it has to happen. Somebody has, has to spoof him because he's easily, he can easily spoof him. No doubt about it. Hey, well, well, you yeah. should do it, Amir. You should do it. <laughs> <laughs> have, you got the diffuser in the background. You ready? All you need is like a, a bottle of whiskey somewhere. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not going to hold nobody in no waiting room for no 30 minutes to join my show. <laughs> Damn. Can you see me? Can you see me? <laughs> right. I don't, yeah, I don't know, man. I'm gonna have people, I'm gonna have hate mail and people knocking on my door if I did something like that. But yeah, Kevin Samuels, my <laughs> brother's crazy. Well, listen, Vic, we thank you for joining us this afternoon, taking time out of your day, my brother. We definitely got to stay in touch. Um, yeah. And before we close, um, we're just gonna shout out where you can follow us. So once again, you can follow us at the Combo Lounge. We also have mm -hmm. our Patreon account. So you can follow us uh, at the Combo Lounge on our YouTube channel and on Instagram, and you can follow me on my personal page at the Prosperous One, the underscore Prosperous underscore one. And for the rest of y'all. You can Antonio find me at Char.Rochelle. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Char, go ahead. At Char.Rochelle on Instagram. Go ahead, Vic. <clears throat> um, you can follow me at Where Kings Reign, exactly how it's spelled on IG. Where King's Reign. Antonio Crow Clothing and the Combo Lounge. Yep. Also, Vic, where can people watch your short film? Yeah. Uh, because it's sort of going through festivals right now, it's, mm. it's okay. one of those things that um, if you just follow me, you'll know when, it, when, when we'll drop it for like right. mass consumption, I guess. Mm -hmm. But sort of how it is, when it goes through festivals, you let it go through its festival process before you like put it out. You know what I'm saying? Well, best so Yo, much success to you. Much yeah. success. I'm so super duper proud of you. Thank I you love so seeing much, all that you're thank doing. You so much. Yeah, I it's appreciate needed. It. Appreciate it. Well, yeah. thank you once again for joining us. And you guys have a wonderful, blessed one. Peace. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for supporting. <laughs>